Biography Karen and Carpenter, March 2, 1950 February 4, 1983, was an American singer and drummer who, along with her older brother Richard, was part of the duo The Carpenters. She was praised for her three-octave contralto vocal range. Her drumming abilities were viewed positively by other musicians and critics. Her struggles with eating disorders would later raise awareness of anorexia and body dysmorphia. Carpenter was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and moved to Downey, California, in 1963 with her family. She began to study the drums in high school and joined the Long Beach State Choir after graduating. After several years of touring and recording, the Carpenters were signed to AM Records in 1969, achieving commercial and critical success throughout the 1970s. Initially, Carpenter was the band's full time drummer, but gradually took the role of frontwoman as drumming was reduced to a handful of live showcases or tracks on albums. While the Carpenters were on hiatus in the late 1970s, she recorded a solo album, which was released years after her death. Briefly married in the early 1980s, Carpenter suffered from anorexia nervosa, which was little known at the time. Her death from heart failure at age 32, related to complications of her illness, led to increased visibility and awareness of eating disorders. Her work continues to attract praise, including being listed among Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Singers of All Time. Early LAFE Karen and Carpenter was born on March 2, 1950, at Grace New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut, the daughter of Agnes Reuer, Nay Tatum, March 5, 1915 to November 10, 1996, and Harold Bertram Carpenter, November 8, 1908 to October 15, 1988. Harold was born in Wuzhou, China, where his parents were missionaries. He was educated at boarding schools in England before finding work in the printing business. Carpenter's only sibling, Richard, the elder by three years, developed an interest in music at an early age, becoming a piano prodigy. Karen's first words were bye bye and stop it, the latter spoken in response to Richard. She enjoyed dancing and by age four was enrolled in tap dancing and ballet classes. The family moved in June 1963 to the Los Angeles suburb of Downey after Harold was offered a job there by a former business associate. Carpenter entered Downey High School in 1964 at age 14 and was a year younger than her classmates. She joined the school band, initially to avoid gym classes. Bruce Gifford, the conductor, who had previously taught her older brother, gave her the glockenspiel, an instrument she disliked and after admiring the performance of her friend and classmate, drummer Frankie Chavez, who had been playing from an early age and idolized jazz drummer Buddy Rich, she asked if she could play those instead. Carpenter wanted a Ludwig drum set because it was used by her favorite drummers, Joe Morello and Ringo Starr. Chavez persuaded her family to buy her a $300, the equivalent of $2,500 in 2019, Ludwig kit, and he began to teach her how to play. Her enthusiasm for drumming led to teaching herself how to play complicated lines and studying the difference between traditional and matched grip. Within a year, she could play in complex time signatures, such as the four in Dave Brubeck's Take Five. The Carpenter was initially nervous about performing in public, but said she was too involved in the music to worry about it. She graduated from Downey High School in the spring of 1967, receiving the John Philip Sousa Band Award and enrolled as a music major at Long Beach State where she performed in the college choir with Richard. The choir's director, Frank Pooler, said that Karen had a good voice that was particularly suited to pop, and gave her lessons in order for her to develop a three-octave range. Career The Carpenters Carpenters' first band was 2 Plus 2, an all-girl trio formed with friends from Downey High. They split up after she suggested her brother Richard join the group. In 1965, Karen, Richard, and his college friend Wes Jacobs, a bassist and tuba player, formed the Richard Carpenter Trio. The band rehearsed daily, played jazz in nightclubs, and also appeared on the TV talent show Your All-American College Show. Richard was immediately impressed with his sister's musical talent, saying she would speedily maneuver the sticks as if she had been born in a drum factory. She did not sing at this point, instead, singer Margaret Shanor guested on some numbers. The trio signed a contract with RCA Records and recorded two instrumentals, but they were not released. In April 1966, the Carpenters were invited to audition at a session with bassist Joe Osborne, well known for being part of the studio musician collective The Wrecking Crew. Though she was initially expected to just be the drummer, Karen tried singing and impressed everyone there with her distinctive voice. Osborne signed a recording contract with her for his label, Magic Lamp Records. He was not particularly interested in Richard's involvement. In 1967, Jacobs left the trio to study at the Juilliard School, 
and the Carpenter siblings were keen to try out other musical styles. Along with other musicians, including Gary Sims and John Bettis, the siblings formed the group Spectrum, which focused on a harmonious vocal sound and recorded many demo tapes in Osborne's garage studio, working out how to overdub voices onto multi-track tape. Many of those tapes were rejected by record companies. The group had difficulty attracting a live following, as their sound was too dissimilar from the hard rock and psychedelic rock then popular in clubs a and Records finally signed the Carpenters to a recording contract in 1969. Karen started out as both the group's drummer and co-lead singer, and she originally sang all her vocals from behind the drum set. She sang most of the songs on the band's first album, offering, later retitled Ticket to Ride, her brother wrote 10 out of the album's 13 songs and sang on 5 of them. The opening and concluding tracks were sung by both siblings in unison. As well as drumming, Karen played bass guitar on two songs, All of My Life and Eve, under Osborne's guidance. On All I Can Do, she played in May 4th time, while Your Wonderful Parade featured multiple snare and bass drum overdubs to emulate the sound of a marching band. The track Ticket to Ride, which was a cover of a Beatles song that later became the album's title track, was released as The Carpenters' first single, it reached number 54 on the Billboard Hot 100. Their next album, 1970's Close to You, featured two hit singles, They Long to Be, Close to You and We've Only Just Begun. They peaked at number one and number two, respectively, on the Hot 100 because she was just 5 feet 4 inches, 1.63 meters tall, it was difficult for people in the audience to see Karen behind her kit. After reviews complained that the group had no focal point in live shows, Richard and manager Sherwin Bash persuaded her to stand at the microphone to sing the band's hits while another musician played the drums, former Disney Mouseketeer Cubby O'Brien served as the band's other drummer for many years. She initially struggled in live performances singing solo, as she felt more secure behind the drum kit. After the release of Now and Then in 1973, the albums tended to have Carpenter singing more and drumming less, and she did become the focal point of all records and live performances, Bash said she was the one that people watched. Starting with the Carpenters' 1976 concert tour and continuing thereafter, she would perform a showcase where she moved around the stage playing various configurations of drums. Her studio performances benefited from close miking that captured the nuances of her voice well. Though she had a three-octave range, many of the duo's hits prominently feature her lower contralto singing, leading her to quip, the money's in the basement, Carpenter always considered herself a drummer who sang. She preferred Ludwig drums, including the Ludwig supersensitive snare, which she favored greatly. However, she did not drum on every Carpenter's recording. She was the only featured drummer on Ticket to Ride in on Now and Then, except for Jambalaya. According to Hal Blaine, Karen played on many of the album cuts and he played on most of the Carpenter's studio sessions where she did not play drums herself, but it has to be noted that Karen was informed about Blaine's involvement and she approved on the basis that she and Richard really wanted a hit single. The duo were happy for Blaine to take the role in the studio as he was a respected session musician and it was easier to record Carpenter's guide vocal without it spilling onto the drum mics. Blaine complimented Karen's drumming skills, but believed her greatest strength was as a vocalist and thought himself more adept at work in a recording studio which required a different approach from her experience drumming live on stage for an audience. On Made in America, Karen provided percussion on Those Good Old Dreams in tandem with Paulinho da Costa, and played drums on the song When It's Gone, It's Just Gone, in unison with Larry London Die in the mid-1970s Richard Carpenter developed an addiction to quaaludes. The Carpenters frequently cancelled tour dates, and they stopped touring altogether after their September 4, 1978, concert at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. In 1980, Karen performed a medley of standards in a duet with Ella Fitzgerald on the Carpenters' television program Music, Music, Music. In 1981, after release of the Made in America album, which turned out to be their last, the Carpenters returned to the stage and did some promotional tours, including an appearance for the BBC program Nationwide. Now was the last song Carpenter recorded, in April 1982. Though Richard was concerned about her health, he still thought her voice sounded as good as ever. Solo Carpenter released her first solo record, Looking for Love Forward Slash I'll Be Yours in 1967 on Osborne's Magic Lamp label. Only 500 copies were pressed, and the label folded shortly afterwards. In 1979, while Richard took a year off to treat his addiction, Karen decided to make a solo album with producer Phil Ramone. The sessions produced music that was different from the usual Carpenter's material, tending more towards disco and up-tempo numbers, 
with more mature lyrics and taking full advantage of Karen's upper vocal register. The album met with a tepid response from Richard and AM executives in early 1980. The album was shelved by AM Records co owner Herb Alpert, in spite of attempts by producer Quincy Jones to convince him to release the solo record after a remix. AM subsequently charged Carpenter $400,000 to cover the cost of recording her unreleased album, to be paid out of the duo's future royalties. A portion of the solo album was commercially released in 1989, when some of its tracks, as remixed by Richard, were included on the album Lovelines, the final album of previously unreleased material from the Carpenters. In 1996, the complete solo album, titled Karen Carpenter, was finally released. Personal Alayafi Carpenter had a complicated relationship with her parents. They had hoped that Richard's musical talents would be recognized and that he would enter the music business, but were not prepared for Karen's success. She continued to live with them until 1974. In 1976, Carpenter bought two Century City apartments that she combined into one, the doorbell chimed the opening notes of We've Only Just Begun. She collected Disney memorabilia and liked to play softball and baseball. Growing up, she had played baseball with other children on the street and was picked before her brother for games. She studied baseball statistics carefully and became a fan of the New York Yankees. In the early 1970s she would become the pitcher on a celebrity all-star softball team. Petula Clark, Olivia Newton-John and Dionne Warwick were her close friends. While she was enjoying success as a female drummer in what was primarily an all-male occupation, Carpenter was not supportive of the women's liberation movement, saying she believed a wife should cook for her husband and that when married, this was what she planned to do to I. In early interviews, Carpenter showed no interest in marriage or dating, believing that a relationship would not survive constant touring, adding, as long as we're on the road most of the time, I will never marry. In 1976, she said the music business made it hard to meet people and that she refused to just marry someone for the sake of it. Carpenter admitted to Olivia Newton-John that she longed for a happy marriage and family. She later dated several notable men, including Mike Kerb, Tony Danza, Terry Ellis, Mark Harmon, Steve Martin and Alan Osmond. After a whirlwind romance, she married real estate developer Thomas James Burris on August 31, 1980, in the crystal room of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Burris, divorced with an 18-year-old son, was nine years her senior. A new song she performed at the ceremony, Because We Are In Love, was released in 1981. The couple settled in Newport Beach a carpenter desperately wanted children, but Burris had undergone a vasectomy and refused to get an operation to reverse it. Their marriage did not survive this disagreement, and ended after 14 months. Burris was living beyond his means, borrowing up to $50,000, the equivalent of $141,000 in 2019, at a time from his wife, to the point where reportedly she had only stocks and bonds left. Carpenter's friends also indicated he was abusive towards her, often being impatient, they stated she remained fearful when he would occasionally lose his temper. Karen Kamen, a close friend, recounted an incident in which she and Carpenter went to their normal hangout, Hamburger Hamlet, and Carpenter appeared to be distant emotionally, sitting not at their regular table but in the dark, wearing large dark sunglasses, unable to eat and crying. According to Cayman, the marriage was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was absolutely the worst thing that could have ever happened to her. In September 1981, Carpenter revised her will and left her marital home and its contents to Burris, but left everything else to her brother and parents, including her fortune estimated at $5 to $10 million, between $14 million and $28 million in 2019. Two months later, Following an argument after a family dinner in a restaurant, Carpenter and Burris broke up. Carpenter filed for divorce on October 28, 1982, while she was in Lenox Hill Hospital illness and D.T.H. Carpenter began dieting while in high school. Under a doctor's guidance, she began the Stillman diet, eating lean foods, drinking eight glasses of water a day, and avoiding fatty foods. She reduced her weight to 120 pounds, 54 kilograms, 8 stone 8 pounds, and stayed approximately at that weight until around 1973, when the carpenter's career reached its peak. That year, she happened to see a photo of herself taken at a concert in which her outfit made her appear heavy. Carpenter hired a personal trainer who advised her to change her diet. The new diet caused her to build muscle, which made her feel heavier instead of slimmer. Carpenter fired the trainer and began her own weight loss program using exercise equipment and counting calories. 
She lost about 20 pounds, 9 kilograms, and intended to lose another 5 pounds. Her eating habits also changed around this time, with Carpenter trying to get food off her plate by offering it to others at the meal as a taste. By September 1975, her weight was 91 pounds, 41 kilograms, 6 stone 7 pounds. At live performances, fans reacted audibly to her gaunt appearance and many wrote to the pair to inquire what was wrong. She refused to declare publicly that she was in ill health, on her 1981 nationwide appearance, she simply said she was pooped. Richard later stated that he and his parents did not know how to help Karen. In 1981, she told Richard there was a problem and she needed help with it. Carpenter spoke with Cherry Boone, who had recovered from anorexia, and contacted Boone's doctor for help. She was hoping to find a quick solution to her problem, as she had performing and recording obligations, but the doctor told her treatment could take from one to three years. She then chose to be treated in New York City by psychotherapist Stephen Levenkrin.